In the vast expanse of space, where silence reigns and stars are silent witnesses, a lone spacecraft hurtles towards the red planet. It's December 3, 1999, and the Mars Polar Lander is on a collision course with destiny. Packed with cutting-edge technology and the aspirations of countless scientists, it promises to unlock the secrets of Martian ice and climate. But as it slices through the thin Martian atmosphere, an invisible adversary lurks within its own systems. A tiny flaw in the software, undetected and deadly. What if a single line of code could determine the fate of a multi-million dollar mission? What if the culmination of years of research and the hopes of unraveling Mars's mysteries hinged on a subtle glitch buried deep within the lander's programming? This is the untold story of how an overlooked software error led to one of NASA's most poignant failures. A narrative of human ambition, technological prowess, and the fragile line between triumph and catastrophe. In the late 1990s, the allure of Mars beckoned humanity with questions of water, climate, and the potential for life. NASA, eager to build upon the successes and lessons of previous missions, embarked on an ambitious project, the Mars Polar Lander, or MPL. The spacecraft was not just another probe. It was a meticulously engineered marvel designed to touch down near Mars's South Pole, a region shrouded in mystery and rich with scientific potential. The MPL was part of NASA's Mars Surveyor 98 program, a duo of spacecraft that included the Mars Climate Orbiter. The lander's primary mission was to study the Martian polar regions, analyzing soil samples and searching for evidence of water ice beneath the surface. For the computer scientists and engineers behind the mission, it was an opportunity to push the boundaries of autonomous systems and software reliability in the unforgiving environment of space. At the heart of the MPL was its flight software, a complex tapestry of code responsible for navigation, communication, and a critical descent and landing sequence. The lander's computing system was built around the IBM RAD 6000 microprocessor, a radiation-hardened RISC chip. Operating at a modest 5 to 20 megahertz of clock speed and with 128 megabytes of RAM and 18 megabytes of EEPROM, the system was a far cry from the terrestrial computers of the time. Yet it was sufficient for the deterministic execution required for real-time control tasks and had been used successfully on prior missions. As the launch date approached, the development team was faced with the immense challenge of ensuring that the software could handle every conceivable scenario. The descent and landing sequence, known as Entry, Descent, and Landing, or EDL, was particularly critical. EDL was an entirely autonomous process. The lander would have to perform all the necessary actions without any real-time input from Earth due to the communication delay of approximately 10 minutes each way. So the EDL software was designed as a finite state machine, managing its transitions between various phases. Atmospheric entry, parachute deployment, leg deployment, heat shield jettison, and powered descent using pulsed thrusters. Each phase was governed by a combination of sensor inputs and timed events, meticulously coded to respond to the dynamic conditions of the Martian entry. One of the key components in this sequence was the touchdown monitor, or TDM, subsystem. The TDM was responsible for detecting the moment of landing by monitoring signals from the lander's footpad contact sensors, simple switches that would close upon contact with the Martian surface. Upon detecting touchdown, the TDM would command the shutdown of the descent engines to prevent the lander from toppling or damaging itself due to continued thrust after touchdown. However, there was a critical nuance in the TDM's operation. During leg deployment, a necessary step before the landing, the leg deployment mechanism could generate transient signals or false positives, similar to those that would be expected from actual surface contact. So to account for this, the software included a provision to ignore sensor signals during leg deployment, preventing premature engine shutdown. In theory, the logic was sound, but the software development process had gaps, particularly in the area of integrated testing and validation. Budget constraints and schedule pressures led to a reliance on unit testing of individual software components rather than comprehensive system-level testing. The TDM logic, while individually verified, was not exhaustively tested in conjunction with the leg deployment sequence under simulated EDL conditions. As the Mars Polar Lander hurtled towards Mars after a 10-month journey, the spacecraft entered the EDL phase on December 3, 1999. The lander executed its pre-programmed commands, shedding its cruise stage, orienting for atmospheric entry, and enduring the intense heat of the deceleration. Telemetry data was minimal by design during this phase to conserve bandwidth and because real-time communication was impossible anyway. The descent progressed and at an altitude of approximately 8 kilometers, the lander deployed its parachute, a critical event confirmed by the onboard logs. 
The legs, stowed during flight to protect them from launch thrusters and space debris, were designed to snap into place using a spring-loaded mechanism. As the legs extended, the deployment generated those transient signals in the footpad sensors. In the software's logic, these signals were supposed to be masked, ignored until leg deployment was complete and the lander was near the surface. However, a subtle flaw lurked within the code. Due to a misinterpretation of its sensor data and handling, the software did not properly discriminate between signals generated during leg deployment and those from actual surface contact. Specifically, the software was designed to ignore one transient signal per leg deployment. In reality, however, the leg deployment could produce multiple transients due to mechanical vibrations and the sensor characteristics. This oversight meant that additional false signals were processed as legitimate touchdown events. Consequently, the TDM concluded that the lander had reached the surface while it was still descending under parachute several kilometers above the ground. But following its programming, the TDM commanded the shutdown of the descent engines, which at that point had not even yet been ignited. The action was queued in the system set to execute once the engine started during the terminal descent phase. As the lander separated from the parachute and initiated powered descent, the engines fired briefly before the premature shutdown command took effect. The result was catastrophic, yet silent. Deprived of the necessary thrust to decelerate, the lander entered freefall from approximately 40 meters. The Mars Polar Lander impacted the surface at a velocity we'll say was far exceeding its structural limits, resulting in the destruction of the spacecraft. Back on Earth, the mission team awaited a confirmation of a successful landing. The Deep Space Network's antennas strained to catch the expected signals, but none came. Minutes turned into hours as engineers pored over the telemetry data trying to piece together the events of the EDL phase. The silence was a harbinger of failure, but the cause remained shrouded in mystery. In the aftermath, a failure review board was convened to investigate the loss of the Mars Polar Lander. Through meticulous analysis of the software code, simulation of the EDL sequence, and consideration of the lander's design, the board zeroed in on the software anomaly associated with the TDM and leg deployment. The loss of the Mars Polar Lander sent ripples through the aerospace community. In the mission's aftermath, NASA assembled a failure review board comprising experts in spacecraft engineering, software development, and emission operations. Their mandate was clear yet daunting to dissect the sequence of events that led to the mission's failure and to unearth any uncertainty or underlying issues in the spacecraft's design, software, or its operational procedures. The investigation began with the scant data available. Due to the limitations of real-time communication during the entry, descent, and landing phase, the MPL was designed to operate autonomously without transmitting any detailed telemetry back to Earth. The lack of comprehensive real-time data meant that the FRB had to rely on pre-landing telemetry simulations, and analysis of the software code to reconstruct the lander's final moments. Attention quickly turned to the software controlling the EDL sequence, particularly the touchdown monitor subsystem. The failure review board scrutinized the software's handling of the touchdown sensors during leg deployment. The deployment mechanism used pyrotechnic devices and spring-loaded hinges to snap the legs into their extended positions. The FRB discovered a subtle yet fatal flaw in the logic that was intended to mask the transients created during deployment. The software was designed to clear the touchdown sensor mask flag upon the completion of leg deployment, which was signaled by a timer rather than an explicit confirmation or a sensor of deployment success. This meant that if leg deployment took longer than expected or if additional transients occurred after the timer expired, the software would incorrectly process those signals as valid touchdown events. Moreover, the touchdown detection algorithm did not account for multiple transient signals. It was programmed to consider any change in the state of the touchdown sensors as a potential landing event. In the noisy environment of leg deployment, this lack of debounce logic, a common practice in electrical engineering to filter out spurious signals, proved to be a critical oversight. In fact, debouncing is such a common problem that I even have an episode dedicated just to it. The FRB conducted simulations incorporating the actual mechanical and electrical characteristics of the leg deployment mechanism. These simulations showed that multiple transients could indeed occur and that the software as written would interpret them as legitimate touchdown indications if the masking flag had been cleared prematurely. Digging deeper into the code development process, the FRB identified deficiencies in the testing and validation procedures. The development team had conducted unit tests on the individual software modules, but had not performed exhaustive integrated testing of the EDL under realistic conditions. 
Specifically, the interactions between the leg deployment mechanism and the TDM were not fully simulated in an end-to-end -end test environment. The software was subjected to hardware in the loop testing, but these tests did not replicate the exact timing and noise characteristics of the actual hardware during EDL. The FRB also examined the software development standards and processes used for the MPL project. As noted earlier, the Lander software was developed using a combination of C and assembly language following the guidelines outlined in NASA's Software Engineering Laboratory standards. However, the application of these standards was inconsistent. Code reviews and peer inspections were conducted, but were insufficiently rigorous to catch the nuanced logic errors in the TDM subsystem. As the Failure Review Board pieced together the puzzle, a clear picture emerged. The Mars Polar Lander was lost due to a software error rooted in inadequate handling of transient signals during leg deployment. The software misinterpreted noise from the leg deployment as a touchdown event, leading to the premature shutdown of the engines, as we saw. So the implications of this finding were profound. The MPL's failure was not due to a fundamental flaw in the spacecraft design or an unavoidable anomaly in space. Instead, it was the result of an overlooked detail, a small bug in the code with catastrophic consequences. This realization prompted introspection within NASA and the broader aerospace community about the practices and pressures inherent in software development for space missions. The loss of the Mars Polar Lander underscored the reality that software errors could be just as mission critical as hardware failures, and perhaps more insidious due to their invisibility until failure actually occurs. The Martian landscape remained silent, indifferent to the fragments of human ambition scattered upon its surface. The Mars Polar Lander, once a beacon of technological prowess, was now an assembly of silent components buried in the red soil. But back on Earth, the echoes of its failure reverberated through the halls of NASA and the broader scientific community. The loss was not merely of hardware and monetary investment, but of data, knowledge, and the collective effort of countless years devoted by dedicated professionals. In the wake of the investigation, NASA faced the formidable task of internalizing the hard truths that were revealed by the Failure Review Board. The software flaw that led to the MPL's demise was a catalyst for introspection and transformation. It became evident that the existing approaches to software engineering, especially in the realm of space exploration, required a paradigm shift. The first step was to address the systemic issues in software development practices. The agency recognized that software could no longer be treated as a secondary component, but as an integral part of the mission's success. Back at NASA, the culture shift was palpable. Engineers and managers alike embraced a mindset that valued thoroughness over expediency. Mission schedules were adjusted to allow sufficient time for testing and validation, acknowledging that the risks of rushing outweighed the benefits. Budget allocations now reflected the increased priority given to software development, ensuring the teams had the resources needed to implement best practices. The Mars Polar Lander's loss was undeniably tragic, but it was not in vain. The mission's failure illuminated the path towards more resilient and reliable space exploration endeavors. The advancements in software engineering practices fortified subsequent missions, contributing to a string of successes in Mars exploration. In 2012, the Mars Science Laboratory mission successfully landed the Curiosity rover on the Martian surface using a novel sky crane maneuver, an audacious feat that required impeccable software coordination. Curiosity's ongoing exploration has yielded invaluable scientific data, deepening our understanding of the Mars geology and the potential for past life. The rover's longevity and performance are, in part, a tribute to the robustness of its software, a silent guardian ensuring that each command is executed faithfully amidst the uncertainties of an alien world. As the narrative comes full circle, the story of the Mars Polar Lander serves as a powerful reminder of the delicate balance between ambition and caution. In the realm of computer science, it underscores the profound responsibility borne by software engineers whose code can propel humanity towards new frontiers or, if flawed, consign dreams to the void. In reflecting upon the Mars Polar Lander, one is reminded of the words of aerospace engineer Theodore von Karman. Scientists study the world as it is. Engineers create the world that has never been. The journey to Mars embodies this ethos, a relentless pursuit to transcend our earthly bounds and expand the horizon of human knowledge. The Mars Polar Lander's silent descent into the Martian oblivion was a somber chapter, but from its shadows emerged a brighter narrative of resilience, innovation, and progress. The experience galvanized a generation of engineers and scientists to strive for excellence, to honor the intricate dance between software and hardware, and to recognize that in the quest to touch the stars, diligence and humility are as vital as ambition. If you found today's exploration of the Mars Polar Lander to be at all informative or entertaining, remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, and so I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to the channel for more stories like this one. And if you're already subscribed, thanks. Please be sure to leave a like on the video and turn on the notification bell. 
If you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, link in the video description. It's everything I know now about living a great life on the autism spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. In the meantime, and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.